Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar tonight, Deep Water Wednesday. Uh, we want to get started with some prayer right away. Um, we've got a couple things. One is Dixie's um, cousin, Dixie's cousin's first cousin's husband. Um, I think I sent this out before to everybody. Um, his name is Dave Taylor. He's got pancreatic cancer. He's in advanced stages of it, and he, he's lost, and so is his wife, uh, Dana. So we want to pray for them. We want to pray that the Lord gets a hold of them and brings them to salvation. And then we also want to continue to pray for Don Andriaco uh, for, for his mind to come back together and for him to be strengthened and encouraged in the Lord and, uh, and be renewed in, in spirit. Um, and then we want to pray for Jeff, uh, Jeff, my young, my son-in-law, Jeff has, um, been experiencing some, uh, some real back issues and he's, um, he's had an MRI and that he, it's starting to really affect his ability to work and things. So we want to be praying for him, uh, that the Lord just touches him as something minor that he can just you know, work his way out of. So let's be praying for him as well. And then Sally Feldman, who is Sue Durbeck's uh, sister, she has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Pretty serious deal. So uh, we want to pray for all of them. The greatest need, I think, in today's society and life is for, uh, for one thing, for us to uh, be healed physically, because Docs only do what docs can do. I mean, they're they're kind of um, see if that makes the light any better. Um, docs can only do what docs do, and they they only um, they're only practicing. Is really the truth of it. They're only they're just practicing, and they can't do any more than what they know. So they need supernatural wisdom in each and every one of these situations, um, other than. Uh, Dixie's cousin, they need salvation first. So we want to pray for them and lift them up before the Lord. Yeah, our leaders too. Thanks, Ed. Because there's a lot going on in this country that just is ugly. Uh, so let's pray. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I thank you, Father God, that you are the Lord of glory. You are our grace, our salvation. Father, when we're down, you're up. And Father, when our hearts are breaking, you have a way of mending us. Father, I ask you, Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus, to reach out to this, this brother in need here, Lord God, uh, of, of Dixie's, Father, her cousin's husband. Father, we pray for, for him. We pray, Lord God, for he and his wife, that, Lord God, both of them would come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And Father, Reach your hand down to touch him, to touch him in this pancreas, Lord God, to change that whole situation. And Father God, we just pray that it would work out for your glory, that you would show yourself strong to them, Lord God, and they would know your grace and your mercy. Father, send them witnesses, send people to speak to them. And Father, send your Holy Spirit to them to soften their heart.
Hello, everybody. I'm back. Have no idea what happened in the middle of prayer, no less. Um, well, let's get back to where we were. I, man, I, I had a really good prayer time, too. I hope you got part of it. Uh, Mike, hola. Good to see you. We, well, we've got some people loading on, so maybe it's a good thing. It, it, it kind of faded away for a minute. Um, I have no idea what happened, but it wasn't good. It just all of a sudden said you're you're out and would not let me get back in. So I came in another way. We want to get to uh, where we started out last week. We we prayed for everybody and and um, I hope you were praying too. A amen. So let's get let's get back to where we were. Um, now, in um, whoops. This is where we left off last week, Genesis 3.22. Um, God says, and, and we're talking about finding Jesus in the Old Testament, finding him in all the different places where, where he was and letting him uh, be exposed because there's so much for us to learn about our salvation and about, and about all the reasons why we're saved. Now, none of us are perfect. Um, we fall. We all fall. We all fall sometimes daily, maybe every hour. But we fall primarily because of our own pride and, and all the conditions of the world that we live in. When Adam and Eve sinned, they allowed sin to come into the earth. And it, it doesn't just affect men. It affects everything. It literally, it affects everything around us. Um, and, and so God banned them, if you will, from eating of the tree of life, because had they eaten of the tree of life, they would have lived forever, but they would have lived forever in sin. So they would have been eternal beings, um, as we are all are eternal beings, but they would have lived forever in a state of sin. They had eternal life, physically had eternal life, which would have put them outside of redemption. They, they would have never been able to be redeemed at that point in time unless God had some other plan, um, it w which is, is not open in the scriptures to us to say that he had plan B. Jesus came to be the tree of life and to return us to that immortality. John three sixteen. for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. It's perpetual life. The kind of life that we're supposed to have is, is not just eternal life. We often talk about eternal life, meaning you live forever. Well, the truth is that in a way, everybody lives forever. It's just some live dying forever. Some live living forever. And the when we talk about eternal, that just means something that doesn't have an end to it. A better way to look at it is the, the real word used in John 3, 16, which is perpetual. Um, yeah, his forgiveness is forever for us. And, and that's a, that's an awesome thing. But the perpetual part is the part I think we got to grab hold of because perpetual means it is an ongoing, continuing life process. And I don't mean that we, um, you know, like we have a little bit of life today and we get a little bit better tomorrow and that type of thing. But perpetual life actually means exactly what Jesus said. I came to give you life in life more abundant. Abundant life is a perpetual life. It means today I, I have gotten life today and tomorrow I'll get life tomorrow. And the next day I'll get life that day. And the next day I'll get life that day. And, and it's, it's a continuing life. When we pass on from this life, then we, we get an, an eternal perpetual life. And so we, we go into a place where there is life and life more abundant, but, but it is a continuous thing, not waves of life coming to us. Um, Adam and Eve had to die in order to have the opportunity for redemption. Now, Jesus' promise is for the perpetual life 
That is what they had in the garden, this thing called rest. This thing called rest. Yeah, Ed, we won't be perfect, but we keep on improving. That is exactly right. We keep on improving in our walk in, in this life by his Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He keeps on leading us. And Richard, it is true. We fall, and, and it. but the word says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. He gets back up. We keep getting back up. That's part of the perpetual life process. Now take a look here at 1 John 2, 15 through 17. John says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Now, we see here the New Testament speaking of, of exactly what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve, basically, they loved the things of the world. And that's the picture we see in the garden. We, we see that picture with the, the first human beings. They struggled the same as we do. Oh, look at that tree. Isn't it good? Wow, isn't that a beautiful tree? Wow, isn't that a tree that is... Th think about the progression here. The lust of the flesh. Lust, lust of the flesh is, is just this way. Um... What, what is God holding up from me? What more can I have? How come I don't have enough? Well, how come I don't have this? How, how come I don't have that? I mean, we, we see this playing out. It, yeah, it's, it is a desire, Ed, it, but, it's, but it's even more than a desire. It's, it's a, um, be, because it's, it's something that, I mean, you can desire something and, and it's not the same as lust. Lust is something that is overtaking and overwhelming, and it's destructive. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Richard. The desire becomes a complaint. That's exactly right. And, and, and that's kind of what lust is. It's, it's a looking at something that you should desire. Like, I mean, Jesus tells us in, in Matthew uh, chapter 4, I believe, it, during the Sermon on the Mount, he says, look, don't, don't go seeking after all these things. Your father knows that you have need of these things. We, we ought to want to live in a nice house. We ought to want to drive a nice car. We ought to want to dress nicely. We ought to want to have a, a pretty spouse, beautiful children, smart children. There's nothing wrong with desiring all of these things. Jesus acknowledged it. Look, your father, your heavenly father knows you have need of these things. Well, if your father knows you have need of these things, why, why would he say they're bad? Why would he uh, chastise us for, for wanting to have nice things or, or to wanting to have better conveniences? And it says God wants you to want things. He knows our needs. Exactly. He does. He wants us to desire things. He wants us, to, the truth is, he wants us to desire better than what we have. I, I mean, I know that rubs people the wrong way because, you, you know, you get in this prosperity gospel thing. But, but he does desire us to, to have better, or he, he does desire for us, for us to be blessed. God's desire for us is that we are blessed. And, and that's right, Ed, we are children of the king. And, and too often in, in way, you know, in past history of Christianity, what has been so often preached is, is we shouldn't want anything. We shouldn't desire anything. We shouldn't have any. If, if we do, it's evil because we're lusting after the flesh. That, no, that, that's not. We should have desires for better things. We should have desires for a better life. When the, when the word says that God's seed has never been seen begging for bread, um, it, and, and the righteous have never been forsaken. What that's talking about is God's people, 
And if you go back through the history of the Old Testament, we see a great picture of God's, God's people. Think about this. Noah had enough that he was able to build an ark, a huge ark. I don't know if anybody's been down to see the one that they built in Northern Kentucky. It is huge. It was enough to hold all the animals, several stories tall. Um, one of the finest things in the middle of a desert. It hadn't rained. It, it, there was no uh, great seas overwhelming. There wasn't even a lake to put it on so he could go out fishing in the afternoon. Now think about that. But he had enough funds, he had enough wherewithal to be able to build this massive thing. We talk about Abraham. Abraham became the wealthiest man in all the land, so much so that people feared him because of the great wealth that he had. How about if we keep moving on through the scriptures? Joseph. Joseph wasn't a pauper. I'm not talking about Joseph the... Um, Mary's husband. I'm talking about Joseph, um, the, the son of, um, of Jacob. And, and when, we, when we talk about Joseph, in the, we, we don't think about it. This guy was forsaken by his brothers, put into a pit, and, and then becomes the second in command of the nation of Egypt. He had everything the king had. He just didn't have the king's uh, ring on his finger, but he had everything else. He had all the power, all the authority, all the wealth. He had it all. He had servants, he, lots of gold. And, and so Ed, Ed says, uh, they think you get greedy. It, it's not wrong to want things. Jesus or just as long as you put God first in everything you do and say and serve him. Sorry, everybody. I have no idea what is happening tonight. It keeps telling me that the um, somehow we, we dropped again. So I have no idea what happened. So anyway, let's get back to what we were talking about. And, and I hope you can hear me. Um, here we see this, this thing that it should be exactly what we see in the garden. There is a lust of the flesh, which it's not wrong to desire things. God desires us to be wealthy. We can go through from, from Noah to Abraham, Joseph, and, and on and on and on. King David, King Solomon. Most of the prophets became wealthy men. And very few people were, were in a state of poverty. Um, 
even when we get to the New Testament and, and people often say, well, Jesus didn't have any money. Jesus didn't have this, didn't it? I mean, he didn't even have a place to lay his head. When, when we, even when we see those types of things and, and comments about those sorts of things, we, we don't understand that Jesus had a treasurer, a treasurer. You don't have a treasurer if you don't have anything. I mean, what, what do you give the treasurer if you, you know? So having stuff is not lust. Desiring good things is not lust. Lust of the flesh is, is just what Richard said before. It is, it is one, um, it, it's dead. It's, um, it, it is kind of what you're saying, dad, you, you must want too much. You, you, you want, you want things that other people have. You, you want more than what the word says you ought to have from, from a standpoint of, um, like an Adam and Eve case, they looked and the snake was able to get in there because they, they looked at what was there and she said, oh, look, that is a fruit that is desirable. It's going to make me wise. What she was saying in herself is, I'm not, God didn't make me wise. She was saying, God didn't give me what he should have given me. He didn't make me wise because didn't she realize she was already wise? Didn't she realize that? Her and Adam named all the animals in the garden. Um, they they knew what to do with everything. Weren't they already wise? They were the only human beings. What did they have anything to compare to? But the devil tempted them and and they turned, they actually turned their desire for being in the garden to a lust and there you go. They want it more than, than what was available. Then there's the lust of the eyes. What do you see? What are you laying your eyes on? She saw that the tree, the fruit of the tree, was good to eat. And, and she you know, convinced herself she needed to do something with it. And then there's the pride of life. Pride of life says, I need to be somebody. I, I'm, I'm not who I ought to be. Many people are, are suffering with this derangement syndrome today where they look at, in the mirror and they say, well, this isn't good enough. This, this is not what I ought to be. I shouldn't look like this. I shouldn't have these features. And so they actually um, go and, and have their faces completely reconstructed. And I mean, men turn into women and women turn into men. And, and they, because they say, well, God made a mistake. If there is a God, he's made a mistake because... I should be like this. I should determine who I'm going to be. I should determine what I ought to be. I should determine my pathway in life. It isn't good enough that God made you a male or a female. It isn't good enough that God made you white or black or uh, Asian or Indian or, or any of the other rainbow of colors that we have in our universe. And so people try to change things. It is... Yeah, they, exactly, Richard. They think they're self-contained power sources. And that is exactly what happened with Adam and Eve. These three things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, are the things that captured Adam and Eve and brought them into sin. And it's not of the Father, but it's of this world. And John says it well, the world's passing away. And the lust for the world is passing away. But he who does the will of God abides forever. There is a. Um, they Adam and Eve were not resting in the provision of God. That's the best way I can say it. They, they just weren't resting in the provision of God. And what what God intended for us was for us to rest in everything in his total complete provision. This is what I just went over, but if you take a look at James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5, it tells us that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So who are the proud? Who are the proud? Aren't the proud those who decide 
within their own heart, God didn't make me good enough. God didn't make me well enough. God didn't make me rich enough. God didn't make me this enough. God didn't make me that enough. And, and they try and uh, determine their own destinies rather than the, the destiny that the Lord's put them on. Exactly, Richard. I will be like the Most High. Mm. See, that that is exactly why God resists the proud. You notice it doesn't say he kills the proud. He wipes out the proud. It says he resists them because God's plan is always to bring man to redemption. Always. So he resists the proud, hoping that they'll turn around and say, you know what? Maybe the Lord did make me uh, to follow him. Maybe he did make me in this manner and that manner. But he gives grace to the humble, those who recognize hey, this isn't my life. This is the Lord's life. And, and I have to follow whatever direction he gives me because otherwise we become bitter. We, we will develop a root of bitterness in us and that root of bitterness will overtake our heart and our life. And instead of discovering who we are and who we ought to be, we, we will decline and, and miss all kinds of favor. In 1 Timothy 3.6, it tells us that we shouldn't place a person in a position of being a bishop or kind of an overseer of, of a church um, if he's a novice because he may be lifted up with pride, it says, due to the elevation of the position. In other words, hey, look what I've achieved. Paul tells us this is the condemnation of the devil. That, that's the con pride. Pride's the condemnation of the devil. And But the word tells us that Jesus himself was, was a humble man, more humble than any other. We find that in the story of Abraham. Abraham was a humble man. We find it in the story of Moses. Moses was a humble man. Over and over again, we find in the scriptures, um, and he, even in David, pe people have a lot of things to say about David because, you know, the, the Psalms he wrote and, and all that. But you look at David and what he wrote, uh, especially about himself. David writes about himself in a, in a very strong state of humility because he, he's not looking to, uh, to tell God what he ought to be or who he ought to be. He's not telling God how that how things should go. That that was Saul. The Lord said, "Hey, I want you to kill all that everybody, every single one." Well, wait a minute here. Those women are pretty fine. Look at their sheep. They, these are good sheep. God God must not know what He's talking about. Man, there's a lot of things to be revealed in the Old Testament about our hearts and about how we are. And and I think it takes a a humble person to to say, Lord, you made me. You made me with these attributes. You, you made me with whatever I have, the equipment that I have. And I, this is just who, I, just who I am. Now help me be the best that I can be with the equipment that I have. Help me never to, um, never to not glorify you with my life. Because I, I'm despising being this or despising being that. That's why Paul talks strongly to the different people groups that he talks to. And he, he talks strongly to them about, hey, listen, if you're in this situation, don't try and get out of that situation, but use that situation to the glory of God. And God, let God pull you out of that, regardless of what it is. Let God pull you out of that. Because in doing that, you give glory to him. Now let's take a look here at Genesis 3, 8 through 9. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Now, who, who do you think this is walking in the garden? Who do you think it is? Is it God walking through the garden? Because I got news for you. Yeah, Ed, it's Jesus. And it's got to be him. It, it's got, it has to be him walking through the garden. Because Je Jesus is the personification of God in, in a human form. 
everybody thinks God is, you know, well, I don't, I don't know, not everybody, but a lot of people think God is, um, you know, this great ball of light or um, this, this weird translucent being that is kind of just there or he is some sort of force or something like that. Listen, the word describes God and describes everything like he's got hands, he's got feet, he's got legs, he's, he's got a head. He, he's, um, you know, it describes God. Uh, we know he's got a right arm because it says Jesus is his right arm. And, and there's all kinds of things that the word talks about to describe who God is. So in the garden, why would we think, um, Richard says, or gray beard off the corner of the universe that cares not. Yeah, that is, that is exactly right. Some people do believe that, don't they, Richard? That's one of the thinking he's gray beard. Yeah. Dad, Jesus is God. That is exactly right. Jesus is God. And so when it says that God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, there's Jesus. Now, the word tells us God the Father cannot be seen by any man. So there must be a way that he is capable of being seen. Right? And the way that he's capable of being seen is Jesus. So it's, it's Jesus walking in the cool of the day. And they knew it was him. They knew when they heard him walking, they knew it was him. And he walks among them in a physical form. But I would have to think at this point in time, way superior because he can come and go from the earth. And, and uh, they knew him. They knew it was him. So he said, I heard your voice in the garden. And I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Here we go. What was the fear that I felt? He had obviously never felt fear before. Because he, he says, yeah, exposure. Whoa. Now, this uh, you see the Hebrew word I put in there. This is Hebrew for, for fear. Yut. Resh Aleph. Mike, exactly, exposure, the guilt of his sin, right? He knew he was wrong. Yud Resh Aleph, he, three Hebrew letters. They, they literally mean this make the head first. Make the head first. Fear, make the head first. Now, what's interesting about this is you might be tempted to say, well, well, fear is, you know, when you make God, because it talks a lot about fearing God. And, but in this instance, this is the first place that we find the word fear used. And what Adam did is he made his head first. He made his head first. Eve made her head first. The very roots of our fears are when we make ourselves first. When we think in our own head above God, fear starts. If Adam truly knew the heart of Jesus, then he would have been. I, I've thought about this. If he really knew the heart of Jesus, would he have been sorrowful? I mean, would he have been fearful? If he really knew the heart of Jesus, if he, if he really understood who God was, would he have been full of fear? Right, Richard? No. He would have been sorrowful and repentant, not fearful. If he really knew the heart of God, he would have come to God immediately. Upon hearing God in the cool of the day, he wouldn't have tried to hide himself. Hide him, hiding himself is still part of the pride issue. It's what every man has to do. This also caused him to want to fix his own problem. We can't fix ourselves. He hid himself. Jesus' response um, would, be, would have been to give him an opportunity to repent. And he did. 
Jesus responded by giving him an opportunity to repent. Didn't he? Hey, why did you know you were naked? Did you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The tree that I told you not to eat of? What does Adam say to that? Does he say, Lord, I'm so sorry. He's got another opportunity here, right? If he really knows who, who the Lord is, if he really understands him in his heart, and, he, and he's thinking God kind of thoughts, what he's going to say is, God, I'm sorry. We shouldn't have done that. What do you think the outcome would have been had Adam repented? Had Adam and Eve looked for God and said, God, we shouldn't have done this. Ed says, after Satan got them to eat of the tree, do you think he said to them, ha ha, I just fooled you? I, I don't know, Ed. It doesn't say anything in scripture to that point. Um, yeah, Dad, he did know he was naked because he was in sin. That's how he knew. And, and you know, the fact that the fact that he didn't really understand who God is, I think, is even more troubling. He, d he didn't trust who the Lord was. I think he knew God put him in the garden. God put him there with all this wonderful, beautiful stuff. And, and he still, he still falls. Now, let's take a look here. Verse 21. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord made, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them, right? He makes tunics of skin for them. Here we have the first shedding of blood to cover the sin of man. God himself took the skins of an animal and formed tunics for them. He covered them so they, they would no longer be ashamed. You know, God does that for us. This is, this is a perfect picture of what God thinks redemption should be. Blood is shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no redemption of sin. Dad, you know, if the garden had weeds, the weeds were good. True. Because he says, everything that he made was good for man. Everything. So every single thing that was in the garden was good for man. I, and then afterwards, he says, the thorns and the thistles are going to turn on you. And they're going to they're gonna not be good for you anymore. There's going to be bad things in the garden after this. Once again, we find here the setup for Jesus to come and remove our, our sin. That should not, it's not sing. Our, that was a typo on my part. Uh, he should remove my sin through the shedding of blood. This also speaks of the character of God through Christ toward man. He's merciful, not judgmental. Think about that. What, what did God say to Adam and Eve? In the day that you eat thereof, you will surely die. The devil used that on them and said, you will not surely die. But he knows you're going to be just like him. You'll know good and evil. No, they didn't just lay around. You're right, Ed. They were gardeners. And, and they took care of stuff, right? Right. Yet, Richard, they did live more than 900 years. And, and that speaks of the mercy of God. He didn't kill them immediately because of their sin, but, but he kept them around for 900 years. And, and he kept them there in, in a state where, where the, their nature had changed. But they understood it. And you see in the brief couple episodes we see afterwards of them, they, they did understand because they taught their children something. And let's move on here another, think about this though, the character of, of Jesus that is displayed in the Old Testament through what happened to Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus said, I did not come to judge the world or to condemn the world, but I came that the world might be saved. Here in the garden, I didn't come to judge you in the garden. I didn't come to kill you in the garden. But I came that you might be safe. You might be saved from yourselves. So he rescues Adam and Eve out of the garden and ensures by protecting the gate of the garden so that they cannot end up in an eternal situation of sin. 
he he ensures that the, they won't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good or of the uh, tree of life, and and so they are. God is protecting him. That's what he's doing continually. Um, yeah, Dad, they did have to replenish the earth, so they had to live nine hundred years because they had to make lots of babies, and they do. So this is speaking of the character of God, and it's a picture of who Jesus is. I mean, it gives us a great picture of who Jesus is. Now look at Genesis 4, 3 through 5. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, I want to show you some things here that when we read this, we, we kind of get caught up in the Cain killing Abel thing, and we don't see the why it happened behind there. In the process of time, first of all, Adam and Eve taught Cain and Abel they should sacrifice to the Lord. Why would they do it otherwise, right? Why would they come and bring an offering of the fruit of the ground? to the Lord. There was nothing wrong, by the way, with an offering of the fruit of the ground. In in the um, book of Leviticus, and I'll hit this on the next page, but in the book of Leviticus, an offering of the fruit of the ground is a thank offering. This here says, and we're going to see a picture of true atonement here, because Cain and Abel bring sacrifices of sweet smelling grains and incense, fruit of the ground. Cain brings what he believe is a satis believes is a satisfactory offering to the Lord. It's a thanksgiving offering. According to Leviticus, this is a thanksgiving offering, a grain offering, a sweet-smelling offering to the Lord. And many of the rabbinical um, uh, writers have written and say that he what he brought was the early type of the thank offering. Abel also brings a sweet-smelling thank offering. But Abel accompanies his thank offering with a sin offering. Ooh. The blood of the firstborn of his flock. In this, he expresses his understanding that he is a sinner and requires a life for a life. Now, Abel's position here is superior to Cain's. Yeah, actually, Ed, the the um, the firstborn of the flock is is what he brings first. I mean, the, the the implication from the scripture we it's hard for us to pick it up in English, but when you go to the original languages, it's he he brought that firstborn of the flock as well as or and also brought the the uh, grain offering. So, so they both bring grain offerings. They're both bringing the thank offering to the Lord. They're both acknowledging uh, their, their respects and honor and glory to God because of, of what the Lord has done for, for them. You know, they're there in the garden. Um, so, so he brings all that to them, right? But, but Abel brings something other. Abel also brings, and he understands he picked this up from his mom and dad. Listen, when God redeemed us from the garden, he, he killed two animals, made tunics for us to cover our nakedness. He, he killed an animal, poured its blood out upon the ground to redeem us, to cover our sin. They, they, they had to have understood it, had to have been horrified because they'd never seen death before. And so these animals died in their place which is also a picture of Christ dying in our place. Those animals died in their place for their sin. Jesus died in our place for our sin. But but here's Cain. And God schools Cain. He goes, listen, um, if you do well, won't I recognize you? But if you don't do well, sin is knocking at your door. What's he telling him here? What do you think he's telling him here? Here, let me let me give you a clue. 
He's telling Cain here. He's saying, listen, Cain. You, you, you can't, you can't wipe away. If, if you could be perfected, I would tell you that. I would have accepted your offering. If you, if you brought an offering to me and it was a thank offering for making me, making you who you are, giving you all the things, I would respect that. But you're not acknowledging who you are. You're not acknowledging the sin that's in your, your life. You didn't cover that. You wanted to come to me and say, look at, look at me. And that's exactly what he's telling him. And he's saying, the minute you do that, sin knocks at your door. And this is God, man. And this is just the way God is. God also tells him, but that's not the right thing. You should rule over that sin. And not succumb to it. And it's temptation. He tells him that. He said, you, you ought to be ruling over that. What, what does God, I mean, God's character and the things that God do does um, over and over again, we see the same things repeat. He tells children of Israel, right? I've set before your life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. He tells Cain, hey, Cain. If you do well, I'll recognize it. But you're not perfected. This isn't about you. You need to acknowledge your need for repentance. You need to acknowledge your need for shedding of blood. And listen, when sin comes knocking at your door, when pride comes knocking at your door, you ought to rule over it. Now, we know from, from Cain's line comes a lot of bad characters. I mean, the scriptures lay out and say, you know, Cain begat, had a son and his son did this. And the first murderer comes out of Cain's family. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a number of other unscrupulous people who come out of Cain's family. Yeah, you're right. Ed, I mean, Richard, you're, you're exactly right. He points out to, uh, God points out to Cain. He says, you don't have a right to be angry with me. You knew what the rules were, Cain. You, you knew what pleased me. Your mom and dad told you what pleased me. He, they, and I'm, su I'm surprised we don't have more of this conversation. It would have been nice if we would have had a lot more of this conversation, right? God, God telling him, Cain, listen. Your mom and dad were told, they were shown. I sacrificed two animals, two living things in replacement of their life. You should have known that. Instead of coming to me and you want to thank me for making a great you, you should have come first with a little humility. Now, take a look at First John. 3, 11 through 12. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brother's works righteous. You see that? See, what Abel brought was righteousness. The shedding of blood. It was righteousness. What Jesus brought, righteousness, the shedding of blood. Cain really is a picture of religion. It is. It's a picture of religion and the law. It's a picture of what Israel went through. Cain brings an evil heart. How can I do it? What can I do? How can I earn it? He's not acknowledging the rest of God at all or the grace of God upon his life or the mercy of God. What he's looking at is, what did I do? What can I do? What have I done? Cain wasn't willing to humble himself before God. He chose not to admit his need for a, redeem for a redeemer by the blood. 
Yet Richard lived by the law, but completely lawless, unable to obey. That is Cain. And, and it, the sad part is, is a lot of people today, right? Look at Genesis 4, 25 and 26. 4, 25 and 26. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call him the name of the Lord. Now, Seth becomes the righteous line from which the Messiah shall come. It's obvious that he is in the place of Abel who knew what was required to cover sin. Because we see Seth and then Seth's children, as you go down the line of Seth, very much different than, than the line of Cain. The Seth's people worship the Lord. Um, in this verse, then began to call on the name of the Lord. There's two different schools of, of rabbinical uh, commentary on that. One is that this is when people began to call idols, began to create idols. I, I'm not in that camp because of, it says that they began to call the name of the Lord. What they be, I think what they began to do, and I agree with this rabbinical commentary on that, is Seth's line began to associate themselves through their names with God, where Cain's line began to associate themselves with the earth, with the world. So, so Seth takes this other line. Yeah, Baal, exactly. In Genesis 5, 28 through 29, it says, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. So Noah becomes a type of Christ here because Noah is going to have the ark, right? The ark where everybody comes in and is saved and rescued if they want to. Noah is uh, said in the New Testament, Noah is a preacher of righteousness. And Noah is going to comfort. Look at the words that are used in um, and calling Noah by his name. This one will comfort us concerning our work in the toil of our hands. Remember what I said about rest last week? You know, we're supposed to rest. In Christ, we're supposed to rest. Noah comes along and, I mean, they don't know how he's going to do it, right? When, um, when, when Lamech has Noah and he and his wife sit down, they go, you know, what do we ought to call this kid? They're not going, man, this guy's, maybe we ought to call him captain, you know, because he's going to build a great big ship. They, they don't know anything about that. What they do know, and the Lord tells them, yeah, it was a prophecy, exactly, Richard. What the Lord tells them in their heart, this one is going to comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands. In this, he becomes a type of Christ. Because he's going to relieve us from the toil of our works. Our works for what? Our works to reach God, our works to obtain God's favor, our works to receive God's grace, our works to please God. It says Noah's going to relieve us of all that. Until this time, until the time of Noah, men were doing what men do. Men were trying to approach God through all kinds of, of idols and sacrifices and things. Yeah, there was a lot of violence in Noah's time. Ed, you're exactly right. And, and yet Noah's going to relieve mankind from their work, which I guess he ultimately does because the whole earth is destroyed, except for Noah and his, his three sons and their wives and Noah's wife. And, and, and the earth begins again. And one of the curses, uh, the, the firmament, that separated the waters from the waters, the waters of judgment, the waters of judgment fall. So those that judgment is gone from the earth at that point in time. So Noah does do some incredible things, and he is a, he's another type of Christ. We're going to pick up and go from Noah forward in the book of Genesis next week. Thank you all. Thank you very much for joining us, and, and uh, I, I hope you learned a little bit of stuff tonight. There's some interesting, interesting things in here. And when we get to Abraham, 
Oh my goodness, There's, there are so many pictures of the living Christ in Abraham's life, coming in and out of Abraham's life and Abraham himself. Uh, there's some interesting things we're going to talk about, about uh, Abraham's son. Uh, um, and and so it it just gets really, really deep. And, and we can see God's hand in everything. We all have a blessed night. Have a great night in Jesus' name and have a great rest of your week. Get over that hump. Blessings to everybody.